So Professor Melanie Tressa King uh, is visiting us all the way from, um, she's a professor at Massachusetts Community College based just outside of Boston. Uh, and she's been doing a whirlwind tour across New Zealand and I don't know, every city across the eastern coast of Australia, it seems. So, um, so she's been, had a very hectic, intense couple of weeks traveling through Australia and New Zealand. She uh, teaches a, let me, let me make sure I get this right, but um, a, a general science um, education course. Uh, she <laughs> teaches biology, but now she teaches, well, and she was playing with the top head and things like that. She teaches students uh, critical thinking and how to assess science, pseudoscience, how to assess um, knowledge and plans in a rigorous way. Uh, and so she's going to go into all the details about that. Uh, she always developed uh, just a very prolific amount of curriculum and resources, and you'll see some of the, the amazing looking content that she creates, uh, both for her website, Thinking of Power to Hum, but also for organizations such as the Mental Immunity Project. Is that what they're called? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so, um, yeah, she, she's a bit of a rock star, I think. She just uh, does amazing work. She's been her work is being more and more influential and getting a lot of attention. And we're very lucky to have her speaking here at the University of Melbourne. So, uh, Melanie, if you want to come up and give her a presentation. Thank you. I am so honored to be here, and uh, thank you to John uh, for helping arrange this, and also for just being an awesome human being, and to Ashley for uh, putting together uh, this talk as well. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. I will do my best to project. It's not my, like, I'm not really good at it. I will try. If you can't hear me, please say some. So, so um, I love teaching general education science. In the United States, at least, I don't know how it works here, but in the United States, when you want to, um, when you're getting a degree, but you don't want to be a scientist when you grow up, you still have to take uh, science uh, courses as part of your curriculum. And in the United States, the vast majority of the time, that course is uh, intro bio, or as we affectionately call it, um, baby bio. And it's basically all of biology in a single semester. Um, I was teaching this course one semester, and um, I looked out at my students, and they were, I would say, bored. My mom would say they had that constipated look on their face, um, a bit deer in headlights, like, Oh my God, what is all this stuff? Um, and I thought, is this really the best use of their time uh, and of my time? So what I did instead is I created a course uh, to teach skills, not facts. Um, and I say this as a biologist. I love biology. My undergrad is biology and chemistry. I have a graduate degree in ecology, plant ecology in particular. And biology is awesome. And I thought I actually had a winning formula. I mean, we get to talk about sex. You get to dissect squishy things, and still, like I wasn't winning them over. Uh, this textbook, I am not naming names, so I did not cite it, but this is the most commonly used intro bio textbook in the US. It's over 800 pages long uh, for a semester, and in that textbook, the very first chapter has about four pages devoted to what they call process of science. And the rest of it is full of interesting facts, but honestly just a bunch of stuff for students to memorize, regurgitate on an exam, forget, and then leave hating science as much as they came to me. So um, here's the thing with facts. I, are, um, I don't know what your backgrounds are. Have you seen the Krebs cycle before? Right, Krebs cycle is part of the process of cellular respiration. Um, the Krebs cycle is extremely complicated. It's, um, facts are forgettable, right? We can also look them up. I mean, I don't have my phone on me right now, but we, we have access to basically all the world's information in our pockets. They also change. When I, facts, we, we hold this idea, um, when I say we, I do a lot of science communication to the general public, and they, they elevate facts to this level of untouchable proof. And that's not how science works. So when I was, uh, first started teaching, there were five kingdoms of life. Now there are three domains and there's kingdoms underneath those. But Pluto was a planet. Um, so 
facts can change over time. And most importantly, that is not what science is. Science is not a body of facts to memorize. It's a process. So I would hold that you can look them up when you need them. And this is honestly true. Every time I teach this, I still have to look it up. And that's OK, right? Being uh, Looking up the information that you need when you need it, is there's nothing wrong with that. The question is, what can you do with it? So this was uh, before the pandemic. I was teaching intro bio. And about midway through the process of cellular respiration, and the student raised their hand in class and said, how do they know that? I don't know. Actually, that's a really good question. So at lunch, I went and talked to the other uh, professors, including chemistry, and I said, well, I had a student ask this question. How do they know that? I don't know. And that ate away at me. Like I kept thinking, um, the process of how we learn something is, is more important right, than what it is that we know. So this was before the pandemic. And I will fully admit at this point, what I'm going to do is tell you a story of um, the mistakes that I've made and what I've learned in response. Honestly, I learned that I didn't know a lot. Um, and I, I worry that the students that I taught pre-pandemic um, weren't able to make sense of science in real time. Right? We all saw science play out. We saw the sausage being made. We had a new virus. Where did it come from? How does it spread? How do we prevent it? We had new vaccines. We'd never had mRNA vaccines before. How do those work? Right? And all of this stuff is really complicated. Right? My background is plant ecology. Um, I will fully admit that I am not equipped to really understand the research on mRNA vaccines. I can read it. I can understand what it is that they're saying, uh, provided I look up some of the vocabulary. But I don't know the body of evidence around that. I don't know the methodology that that field uses. I, I, there's a lot I can't use to put those things into context. So what I wanted my students to be able to do was understand this process and be able to find information. I ran into this quote. Um, this book, by the way, is wonderful. I don't use a textbook for my class, but if I were, this would be one of the ones that I would recommend. Uh, it's how to think about weird things. And at the very beginning of the book, they say this quote. And I thought, oh my god, yes. Science is good thinking. The process of science is empowering. Being able to find information, to use it to make better decisions. That is how you take control of your life. So. I came up with thinking is power. We've all heard knowledge is power, and that's true. But honestly, there's too much to know. And the pace of what, uh, the knowledge that we're producing, you just can't keep up with it. It is impossible. The question is, when you need information, can you find it to make, uh, find reliable information? Because there's a lot of crap out there, too. Can you find it to make reliable, informa uh, reliable information to make better decisions? So instead of knowledge is power, Thinking is power. Um, and I would just like to acknowledge that John in this process has been very helpful. And my adorable little tip logo, I call them tip, you know, thinking is power, with a little brain. And that, that was designed by the amazing graphic designer, Wendy Cook. So on this site, if you are interested, the foundation section is essentially the foundations of my course. The topics is using those foundations to make, um, uh, apply to different things like uh, psychics, and alternative medicine and ghosts. Uh, and then I have a section for educators as well with some of the activities that I do in class. So the teach skills, not a facts approach. The three skills that I focus on are critical thinking, information literacy, and science literacy. And importantly, they are in that order. Because what I found is if you don't start with how um, biased and irrational we are, how we can be misled, by our experiences and by our rational thinking. If we don't start with that, then when I go into class now with other uh, courses and I start with, all right, first day, process of science, why do we need that? Why do we need a process of science? And the logic of that process also doesn't necessarily make sense. So first, let's think better. Understand how we think and learn to think better. Then let's apply it to information because also we bring our biases to how we search for information. 
and then the process of science. Now, I also have different strategies. I'm very briefly going to talk about the floater toolkit and misinformation. I don't have time to talk about the inoculation activities, but they are fun. Uh, I have students create misinformation so that they learn how the techniques of misinformation can mislead. The other thing is, I always start with non-triggering misinformation. Let me give you an example. Here's my Flutter toolkit. Um, so Flutter, um, I introduced this early in the semester. It takes me about a week. Um, and then, throughout the rest of the semester, I spend more time on things. So for example, um, logic. About week four or five, I start to go into logical fallacies and to um, how um, the different structures of arguments, different types of arguments. Um, objectivity, that's how can we think better, recognizing our biases and um, um, the heuristics that influence our thinking. So I spend more time the rest of the semester. This is the overview of that. And with misinformation, do you know what this is? Okay. <laughs> This is perineum sunning. And if you want to laugh later, what I would do is go on TikTok and search for this because it is hysterical. The videos are gold. It's basically people putting their buttholes up to the sun because like energy and extra vitamin D and vibrations and it does all these amazing woo things. And yes, there are people that have gotten sunburns on their bum. So also avoid that. <laughs> but like nobody's offended by this. This is funny. Right? I start with misinformation that is not triggering. There's a lot of organizations that focus on misinformation, and I'm glad that they do. They focus on climate change misinformation, or evolution misinformation, uh, GMOs, whatever it is. Those things are certainly important, but if I go into class and I start with vaccines, I'm going to trigger some people. And that triggering is going to result in them not hearing the message. So I start with things that are funny, and I build up. So um, the very first week, I talk about witches. I'll talk about them in a second. Um, and then I go into ghosts and um, homeopathy and UFOs, and I work my way to um, Reiki and um, homeopathy and vaccines. Like, I do get there, but I start with the training wheels on. So, um, like a lot of my students um, use homeopathy. And I hold, and I believe this firmly, this is my complete anecdotal experience, but none of them know what it is. They think it's just natural medicine, that it's herbs, and it's, you know, that's not what this is. Do, you all know what homeopathy is? When I explain this to them, they're like, wait, what? Yep. Can you believe that, right? This doesn't make any sense. It's not plausible. But I work my way there. I allow them to practice and slowly build up over time. So I start with critical thinking. This is a really fun thing to do if you're in a room full of educators and ask them if they teach critical thinking. Well, yes, of course. Um, at my college, if you teach a science course, any science course, by definition, you are teaching a critical thinking course. Those are our union rules. Now, I know now I was not teaching critical thinking. But I know that now because I learned that I wasn't. Next question, after you ask them if they are teaching critical thinking, ask them what critical thinking is. You're going to get a different definition from every single person. Because then you could ask them, well, how do you teach that? What I've learned about critical thinking, and the literature supports this, critical thinking has to be taught directly. It can't be a, an outcome of your subject. You have to specifically teach critical thinking. Apply it to your subject, but you have to specifically do it. So, um, and here's the thing with critical thinking. I've talked about educators. And again, I do a lot of science communication online. Everybody thinks they're a critical thinker. We all know that's a good thing. We don't want to be fooled. So yes, I'm a critical thinker. We're born thinking but we're not good at it, right? Through all of human history, it wasn't until the last few hundred years that we started to use a process of science. Statistics is only a few hundred years old. All of human history, that stuff does not come naturally. We have those tools available to us, but we have to learn and notice 
how we are not doing that and correct it. Also, it's not enough to know how to think critically. You have to want to do it. And that's hard. You have to have the motivation. So in class, I use a lot of what's the harm. Like, what's the harm of not thinking critically? If you treat your baby with homeopathic remedies as opposed to evidence-based medicine, that child can die. There are examples of that. It is terribly sad and really frustrating to watch. You can have death. You can have social harm. Like For um, the public not accepting climate change, we don't vote for climate change policies. Also, and I tell my students this all the time, look, I'm cheap. I don't want to waste my money on stuff that's not actually going to work. So you might go to a psychic and they only charge you 50 bucks, but I think 50 bucks, I could spend that on something else. So what's the harm of not thinking critically? Now we talk about all of this in class. I will say the, a couple things on here that are really difficult to do is detaching your beliefs from your identity. You don't have to totally detach, but to keep your identity as small as possible. When we attach a belief to how we see ourselves, our, our personal identity, our social identity, when we do that, threats to that belief are literally in the brain, they activate the same portion of the brain that perceives physical threats. That's why I start with butthole swimming, for example. So we want to learn to detach our identities. Also, this idea of black or white, yes, no, true, false, fact, not fact, proven, not proven, right? Proportion our beliefs, um, uh, how true we think something is. So here's how I start class. Day one, syllabus. At the end of the class, I say, let me back up for a second. At the end of the class, I say, okay, um, this is a class on critical thinking. I have a friend who is an astrologer, and she's pretty famous. She's written some books. She's been on TV a lot. I'm not going to tell you who she is because I don't want to bias you too much. But she has offered to give you free personality assessment. We want to test how effective she is. So if you're interested, just need you to fill this out, and I'll have it for you next class, hopefully. And that sheet has things... I'm priming them. It's things like your name and your birthday, but also um, if your house was on fire and you could take one thing with you, what would it be? Or um, if you could do one thing for a living and get paid for it, what would it be? That question is awesome. You learn a lot about students. You get everything from sleeping to eating to watching Netflix. I had one student say a porn star, right? Doesn't matter. I primed them. Next class. I say, okay, um, I've got your results. And um, what I want you to do is read them silently. I don't want you to influence other students, but read them. And we're going to see how effective you think she is. So what they get is something that looks like this. It's, it's a full page, though. It's full of more than this. So in the 1950s, there was a psychologist named Bertram Four. And he, he did this experiment on uh, his psychology students, because that's what psychologists do. <laughs> so um, he had them, how effective, or how accurate is this? And on a scale of one to five, it was about 4.3. And my results show that as well. So I had them vote you know, with their heads down so they can't see. It's about 4.3 to 4.5 out of five. OK, now what I want you to do is get to the person next to you. Uh, and if you feel comfortable, Explain, um, talk to them about why you thought your reading was accurate. What about it was accurate? And they talk, and sometimes they talk, and they keep talking, and it takes them maybe 10 minutes before they realize they all get the same reading. And then they start to like murmur and chuckle, and wait a minute, these are all the same, Professor. Yes, indeed they are. Yes, I lied to you. <laughs> um, I know that's risky on day two. But I did it for free. And I did it for educational purposes. Now let's talk about why you fell for that. So confirmation bias. I primed them. I appealed to authority. But also, you have this need for others to like you. Who does that apply to? Oh, some of you that doesn't apply to? Oh, awesome. Uh, OK, at times you're extroverted and sociable, while other times you're introverted and reserved. All right. <laughs> so these are what are called Barnum statements or four statements. They're vague, and they apply to basically everyone. 
also some of them commit what's called a rainbow ruse, where so like it's this and this. At times you're introverted, but other times you're extroverted. By, by playing both ends of the spectrum, you can't be wrong. So we get to talk about Barnum statements. And this is the basis for horoscopes, for tarot readings, for personality assessments today, like the MBTI. That's basically Barnum statements. There's really not good science to support that. But we all think, oh, yeah, that's me, because that's the effect it produces. Now, the reason I do this is because I want students to recognize that they can be fooled. I could tell them I can fool you. I'd be like, yeah, OK, I'm too smart. No, really, you can be fooled. Let me show it to you. So after I fool them and convince them they can be fooled, a very important aspect of critical thinking is not just demanding evidence, but recognizing that you might be wrong. Then after that, I start with witches. The very first lecture, I tell students, OK, I, um, I don't want you to take notes. That's not the purpose of this. I just want you to listen to the story. And then we're going to talk about why I told you this story. And I tell them the story of the witch trials in Europe in the 1400s to like the 1600s. Now I'm in Massachusetts, where the Salem witch trials were as well. Um, and we talked about the kinds of things that witches were accused of, and the kinds of ways they kill witches. What were the evidence for the witches? Well, the best evidence was confessing or being accused. By the way, if you were accused, um, and you denied it, that was proof that you were a witch. And why would you confess? Well, let me show you. So um, you could probably, I would not recommend this for under college students, but with college students, I say, okay, yes, this is terrible, but let me show you what happened to people. There's the wheel of compassion. I don't know why they call it that, where they would roast people over coals. Uh, death by water boiling. There was, um, oh, the Spanish boots, these big iron things with spikes on them. They'd put on um, joint, uh, limbs and then beat it until your bones shattered. There was the uh, stretching. Uh, there was this, uh, they called it a Spanish donkey, and it had this um, metal point at the top, and you spread your legs over it, and they would weigh you down until basically you were sliced in half. People would be alive until it reached their navel. I would confess to anything, and people did. But here's the thing. Oh, okay, so, so we finished that. Um, and I will, like, the day I put together that lecture, I was traumatized. That's horrible. Humans are really creative and cruel when it comes to harming other people. But they were convinced they were right. So why did I tell you this story? Well, they really believed it. They believed these people were witches that were causing crops to die or storms or some birth defects, whatever it was. Why did they believe that? Well, they had evidence. How good was that evidence? Now, my students generally almost never believe in witches. So this is a relatively safe belief. They can look at it from bird's eye view and go, well, that really wasn't good evidence. But they were really sure. And my point isn't to condemn others, but to point the finger inwards. What do you believe that might not be true? How sure are you? And what is your evidence? Is it good evidence? So after witches, um, we start to talk about basic epistemology. I give them this exercise. This is Socratic questioning. Um, street epistemology does a great job of this as well. It's basically a summary of this. Um, and again, I'll start with something that's relatively non-triggering. So for example, uh, how, many speeches, how many species of elephant are there? How many do you think? Some of you don't get to vote. I'm going to guess three. African, um, Indian, and there's another one in towards the end. OK, so we've got three, and you named three. Interesting. OK, anybody else? Three? At least one. At least one. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm guessing you're pretty confident in that one. <laughs> OK, so you do something like the elephant. How confident are you in your answer? Put a number on it. This is important. If you put a number on it, I'm guessing you're not going to be 100%. Okay. Where did that belief come from? This is where you start to think about, well, this is in my brain. How did it get there? Is it 
I don't know, TV, zoo, people around you, right? This actually gets you to start thinking about where did I get that? Um, your reasons for believing. Uh, number uh, five is really important. If I told you you were wrong, how would you feel? Who here would be just crushed and defensive and it refused to admit that you were wrong, <laughs> right? Um, this one is important here because that is the feeling that we are going for with all of our other beliefs. If you're emotionally attached to a belief, it's a pretty good sign that it's attached to your identity and you're not willing to be objective about it. Now, this is a pretty safe belief, so that's fine. But again, put vaccines on it, work your way there. Um, and you should always be able to find evidence that changed your mind. Now, the answer, by the way, is three. Congratulations. Um, it is the, so in the olden days, there was two, uh, the African and the Asian. Uh, and about 25 years ago, the African was split into two with genetic evidence. That would be the forest and the savanna elephants. Also notice that's a fact that changed. We learned more and changed a fact. Okay, so we work starting something like that, work our way some, up to uh, more pressing things over time. All right, we wanna be skeptical. This word is another one of those great words where if you ask people what it means, even, so I'm part of skeptic groups. If you ask skeptics what this means, they're all gonna tell you something different. To me, I like uh, David Hume, uh, a wise person proportions their beliefs to the evidence. A skeptic is going to say, oh, that's interesting. Is that true? How do you know? Show me. I will accept it if you provide me evidence. Skepticism, though, um, is often confused with denialism. Denialism is refusing to accept a strongly supported conclusion. That is not skepticism. Um, I've proportioned, uh, like, I've made this look like a line, um, and it is a spectrum, but it's actually more like a horseshoe. Because often if you're gullible in one area, it's because you're denying something else in another area. What we're going for is the sweet spot, the Goldilocks zone. Acceptance with evidence. You've all seen the dress, right? right. Okay, who here sees the dress as black and blue? Okay, who sees it as, um, is it white and gold? Okay, that is, that is shocking. Um, actually, when this came out, Taylor Swift tweeted, uh, oh, I have her tweet. I don't understand this odd dress debate and I feel like it's a trick somehow. I'm confused and scared. P.S. It's obviously blue and black. Okay, it's really fun though to get in a room full of people where the person next to you disagrees on the color of a dress. By the way, it's blue and black. In real life, the dress is blue and black, so I'm right, just gotta say that. Um, but if we disagree on something so basic as what a dress looks like, imagine doing this for ideology, politics, gun rights, abortion rights, uh, vaccines. We can literally perceive reality differently than other people. And what's great about this is that um, a lot of us will debate, well, you're wrong because of this. You're wrong because of this. Here's why I'm right. Whereas a more um, productive response would be, wow, you see that differently? That is fascinating. Why? What is reality? Let's work this out together. I have found that uh, so I do a section on limits of perception and memory. This is one of the most challenging aspects of the semester and one of the most important. People trust their personal experiences. People trust, I know UFOs are real because I saw one. I know homeopathy works because I tried it and I felt better. Our personal experiences, I have, when I post about this kind of stuff, especially memory online, I'll get people accusing me of gaslighting them. It is disconcerting to think that you don't experience reality as it is. It's uncomfortable. So this lesson of not trusting your personal experiences, this is why we need science, by the way, our different perspectives provide different testable hypotheses, 
of which we can use a process of science to figure out what reality is. We have to admit to ourselves that our personal experiences aren't necessarily an accurate depiction of reality. So I'll tell students my, I have a ghost story. Um, when I was a kid, I, I saw a ghost. I was sleeping, my, I was about five. Uh, my grandma was staying over, so she was sleeping next to me. And I felt this fingernail going up my arm really slowly. I opened my eyes and I saw this old woman and she had like long, draggly white hair. I could still see her. Um, I tried to wake up my grandma to help me. And the old woman covered my mouth. I can still feel her cold hand on my mouth. I tried to yell louder. She put her hand on my chest and I, could, I literally can still feel that cold hand. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, oh, you don't count. <laughs> So um, this is sleep paralysis. Has anybody experienced sleep paralysis? It can be really frightening. Sleep paralysis is that in-between state where your brain wakes up, but the neurons to your body are still shut off. I mean, we don't want to act out what we're doing in our sleep. So it's that in-between state. Now, here's the thing. Your brain is awake, but your body can't move. And so your, body wants, your brain wants to explain why. We always want to know why. So why can't I move? And your brain jumps to assumptions, uh, conclusions based on basic assumptions of what you know. So sleep paralysis throughout history has produced all kinds of terrifying paintings and stories of like demons on chests, succubi and incubus and, and um, ghosts and uh, alien abductions, mass murders. Mine, um, I was five. And my ghost was the um, witch from Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. She was terrifying. You've seen this movie, right? My five-year-old brain thought that was the most terrifying thing it could possibly think of. But if I didn't know what that was, I would still be convinced the ghosts were real. So we have to um, be, we have to proportion our confidence in something. Um, and recognize that we, we might be wrong. Um, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip a little bit through this, but uh, we talk about metacognition. Are you familiar with the rider and elephant analogy? Or maybe Daniel Kahneman, System 1 and System 2 thinking? So um, is Daniel Kahneman won a, a Nobel Prize for it. I don't want to discount that. But um, Jonathan Haidt uses the rider and the elephant, and I think it's a lot easier for students. So the idea here is that in your brain, if you imagine um, you have an elephant and a rider on top of the elephant, the elephant is really strong. Uh, it's always on, it's emotional, it's biased, it's um, tribal. Um, the writer is the part of the brain that can think critically, logically, um, and it's the part of our brain that we think is, is us. The problem is the elephant is really hard to control. So usually what happens is the elephant jumps to a conclusion based on its pre-existing beliefs, its biases, its emotions, and so on. The elephant says, Here's what's happening. And the writer goes, yeah, that sounds right. Doesn't notice that what happened. Doesn't notice what just happened. But instead, um, starts to find justifications for why the elephant is right. Actually, so if you think of the writer like the, um, the PR department for your elephant or the lawyer for your elephant, I have all these reasons for why my belief is true. We need to recognize that's what's going on in our brain. Um, so, for example, we think that what we do is follow evidence logically to reach a conclusion. Of course my position is correct. I've thought about it, and here's the evidence for it. And we can find evidence to support anything we want. But what we usually do is, here's the elephant. The elephant says, this is true. And it uses motivated reasoning and confirmation bias to find the evidence that it needs, to find the evidence to say, yes, this is true. And the problem with this actually is it results in overconfidence. Um, Daniel Kahneman actually said if he had one, if he had a magic wand to eliminate one bias, what would it be? And he said overconfidence. When we're really confident, we're not open to changing our mind with evidence. So we have to avoid that. Again, the whole point of doing it, this is to get students to recognize um, how irrational we can be. If we want to understand reality, we need to recognize what our brain is doing. 
So we also need to evaluate arguments. This is uh, Cranky Uncle with, uh, from John Cook. Cranky Uncle is awesome. It's a, a game, it's free. If you've never played it, I would strongly recommend it. Cranky Uncle is a science denier. And you know who Cranky Uncle is, right? It's a character we all recognize. In the game, the, uh, you learn the techniques that he is using to get to his uh, uh, not strong conclusion. So the techniques of science denial. In this case, this is an anecdote. A great way to do this, by the way, is this is a parallel argumentation. So if I have a parallel argument for this, um, Stephen Colbert did a great job. So um, I know there's no global hunger because I just ate a sandwich. Comedians love parallel argumentation. So the arguments must be logical and not commit fallacies. Now, fallacies are, I think, a really important tool for students to be able to evaluate arguments. There's about a gazillion of them, and they each go by a bunch of different names, and there's all kinds of sub-fallacies and overlaps with other fallacies. Like it can be in a rabbit hole. But there's, a, in my estimation, about 15 that if you learn, you can um, recognize some of the key techniques in uh, misinformation. So appeal to nature, this is one of the most common in alternative medicine. By the way, all these graphics are available on my website. So um, it's natural, so it's, it's safe. Oh, I shouldn't have shown you. I have this great meme for Australia. It's uh, somebody who says um, natural, safe, and then there's the continent of Australia with like um, snakes and spiders and salties and, um, oh, is the bird that can kill you. Cass Castle, where? Oh, yeah. And Australia says, hold my beer. <laughs> um, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. There's also appeal to tradition. Look, it's been around for a long time. So it must be true. Or some authority says it's true. Look, I've got a white lab coat on. Or I'm a celebrity. So it must be true. This one, oh, this one is so hard. Um, mistaking correlation for causation, essentially. Two things happen together, so one must have caused the other. This one is extremely common. Uh, and the straw man, this is one of the best ways to defeat a science argument, is to just misrepresent it. So, learning key fallacies is an important part of critical thinking. And then I get to information literacy. Like I know this is a lot of information, I apologize. Um, but it, it's um, the overall of how we structured this course. After we talk about um, information or critical thinking, I get to information literacy. Because I want students, I don't have them memorize anything. Their, their exam is next week, their final. It's all COVID based and it's all open everything. In real life, you're gonna have information available to you. So can you use information, can you find reliable information and use it to make better decisions. So we talk about why we fall for misinformation. It's us. If I think something is true and I wanna check, I'm gonna to go to Google and I'm gonna type in what I think is true. Vaccines cause autism, boom. I can find evidence to support that. So I need to know my own biases that I bring to this. I need to recognize that the reason I'm falling for misinformation, I mean, obviously they're trying to fool us, but um, confirmation bias, if it confirms what we already think is true, we're not gonna check. We just believe it. Or if it appeals to our emotions, if it makes us angry or afraid, it makes us laugh. I mean, this is why people fall for satire. It's funny and it fits with what we think is true. And if it's repeated, this is a problem if you're in an echo chamber because that information is just constantly pinging around. And your brain assumes ease, um, uh, familiarity and ease of processing with truth. The point here is that if we want to be good consumers of information, we need to recognize our own biases when we look for information. And then I teach them how to fact check, how to find information. The most important thing is to be skeptical. If you're not skeptical, if that part of your brain, if you don't listen to that part of your brain that says, wait, is that true? Does that make sense? You're not gonna check. So you have to be skeptical. And then you have to know how to find good information. Are you familiar with lateral searching? Okay. Um, most of us have been taught that when we look, it, it, let's say I find a site that I've never seen before and I wanna know if it's reliable. We go to the About Us page, we check their mission, 
Who do they say they are? We look at the content on their site. We look for um, uh, signs like um, inflammatory language, bias language. We check their links. You can spend forever on a site. And if a site wants to mislead you, they probably can. That's called vertical searching. We're looking through a page this way. The fastest and most reliable way to fact check is to look laterally. Open a new tab, lateral, search the site or the claim, and then fact check or reliable. And then use the power of the information ecosystem to tell you um, about that site. Don't listen to them, listen to others, reliable sources. And yes, Wikipedia is a great place to start. Wikipedia is actually pretty reliable. Use their uh, references at the end. Okay, after we do information, then I get to science. There's a lot of ways to define science literacy, and what really bugs the poo out of me is every time I see somebody talking, well, most of the time when uh, there's an assessment of science literacy, it's um, how long does it take the Earth to go around the sun? Or which is bigger, uh, an electron or uh, an atom? Or um, all of these detailed, like fact questions, as opposed to the process of science. So science literacy in, in this definition, and this is the one that I prefer, is understanding how scientific knowledge is produced. And then being able to use, find and use scientific information to make better decisions. So understanding what science is. This here is a great resource, Understanding Science at UC Berkeley. <laughs> Theory is one of those words that ugh, people don't understand what it is. They think, oh, it's just a guess. Because you know, in real life, it is just a guess. But gravity is a theory. Evolution is just a theory. When evolution is proven, it will become a fact or a law, and then I will accept it. That's not how that works. So science is a community of experts collectively um, uh, collecting and evaluating evidence. And the community aspect is important here. People aren't in silos. We each have our own biases. We need others to check us. And that's why scientific knowledge is so reliable, because it's a community process. A lot of, um, in the United States, I don't know how it is here, but in the United States, especially for like K-12 and um, the non-major science courses, and actually even some of the majors courses, very beginning of the textbook, there's this recipe like, you know, make an observation and then formulate a hypothesis and then you do an experiment and you did a science. It's a recipe. You follow it, done. There is no single scientific method. There is no one way to do this. So perceiving science like this, I have found again, anecdotally, that people will see other ways of doing science and discount it when they want to, when they're motivated to. Um, the other thing is most of these recipe labs have right answers. So when you're done, you're supposed to get this answer. And I've even seen students in class didn't get the right answer and the teachers will say, well, here's what you were supposed to get. That's not how science works. I love this lab. Are any of you um, potential educators or current educators? Wonderful. This lab is fantastic. It's from uh, UC Berkeley again. They call it the Chex Lab. The idea is um, you have moved into a house and the previous occupants left some old checks lying around. And you're going to use those checks to learn about them, explain their story. There's a series of 16 checks and um, you start, you put students in groups, draw four checks randomly, right? Propose initial explanation. There's your hypothesis one. Okay, after they do that, pick four more and then pick four more. Notice they didn't get all of them. And then when they're done, what is your explanation and why? Why did you come to that explanation? What I've noticed is, um, so OBGYN, I have a lot of young male students, they have no idea what that is. So when there are women in that group, they can explain what an OBGYN is. But if they didn't have that perspective, they would not know. Um, I have, oh, Kids R Us. <laughs> I don't know if you know what that is, it's a, a, a kid store. It doesn't exist anymore. So if they're really young, they might not know what that is. Notice that the diversity of the groups helped provide perspectives 
to see things that might not otherwise be seen. This is an example of historical science. Um, geology, epidemiology, um, there are different ways to collect, so observational science. I love this lab. At the end, I put them with other groups. You go with this group. What did you come to and why? And at this point, they're fully invested in the story. Like, what happened? Oh, I and mean, they're arguing about it. And then they get all done and they're like, okay, so what happened? Right? They want me to know, want me to tell them. And I don't know. All I have are those 16 checks. They hate that. But that's how science works. It's not like at the end of your experiment you get the right answer. All you have is your evidence and the kinds of reasoning and perspectives you can provide from that evidence to get to a conclusion. The uncertainty really bugs them, but that's what I'm going for. We might not know all the way. No, so conclusions are tentative, but that doesn't mean that all conclusions are equally tentative. Right? Some we have more support for. So I like to think of science more like this. I vision a tree ring, like almost growing outward, where in the middle you've got the stuff that um, by definition has continually been tested because the stuff on the edges requires it as basic assumptions. So it's constantly tested, it's more certain, and it grows over time. The news really likes the new stuff. There's this sexy new study that says that everything is wrong. Scientists are completely baffled by blah, blah, blah. Science has shown that cancer can be cured by, and then you look at it, and it's um, cells in a petri dish or in mice. Um, I find that the edges of science being represented in the news like that for people makes students go, well, they don't know anything. That's not true. There's a body of evidence in the middle that we do know. No. And also, scientists are always changing their mind. I don't know why that's a bad thing. Changing your mind with evidence should be, com it's commendable, right? We want to change our mind with evidence. The other thing I find with science literacy, um, a lot of science teachers say, well, yeah, I teach science literacy. I have my students read primary literature. Okay. I've already told you that when I get to primary literature with mRNA vaccines, I'm kind of stuck, right? I don't fully understand it. It's not put in context for me. I don't have the expertise. And what I find is, uh, having a conversation with somebody on social media, they think something is true, so what they'll do is go to Google Scholar, type in what they think is true, find a study, a study that says, and it's in some journal that's a predatory journal, or it's um, a, a low quality journal, or it hasn't been replicated, or it's even been uh, disproven, but it's still in the literature. They can't tell the difference. All they know is science says I'm right. I think relying on primary literature this way is dangerous. Primary literature is for nerds to talk to other nerds. Specific nerds to talk to others, that's great. But it's not for people who aren't nerds in that area. There's great secondary sources. There's great tertiary sources. It's not, is it primary or tertiary? It's how is the quality of that? And quite frankly, secondary and tertiary sources for non-scientists can be much more useful if you can find quality uh, sources. Um, the danger of that single study. So um, you, have you seen pyramids of evidence? So um, use, usually they focus exclusively on humans, and that's great, but like there's all kinds of science that doesn't involve humans. So I tried to make a pyramid that was more representative of other types of science as well. But individual studies are like pieces of a puzzle. There's this one, and there's this one, and this one. When you start to put the pieces of the puzzle together, that's when the bigger picture starts to make sense. So the stuff at the top that's been um, synthesized and evaluated by those specific nerds that says this is the most reliable uh, conclusion we can come to at this point in time. Headlines that say a study says make that skeptical alarm go off in your head. Now, I told you at the beginning my students were scared and bored, and that is all true. Um, I'd like to say that they're not at all that anymore, but some probably are. But I do get a lot more comments like this. I've had students call their mom in the middle of class to talk about the supplements in their medicine cabinet. Or um, they come back to me and say they talk to their girlfriend about astrology. This stuff is relevant to students. They are exposed to pseudoscience and science now. That 
Poo is everywhere. Giving them the opportunity to address that in class helps them see the difference between the process of science and the process of pseudoscience, the difference in the qualities of evidence. Um, Carl Sagan said if we teach only the findings of science instead of the process, how can anybody tell the difference between science and pseudoscience? He is right. We need to teach the process. And importantly, now I don't have to cover every single type of pseudoscience in science now because that is endless, right? It's a fire hose of poo. I don't have to cover it all because I've given students the tools to evaluate it themselves. So um, the original article is in Skeptical Court. It's free online if you'd like to read it. Uh, my website, I have all of those graphics and more. Um, if you want to follow me on uh, social, I try to do especially Facebook something every day. Um, and thank you for your time. I really appreciate 